Hello, and welcome to Spotlights. This is a podcast for the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. And as usual, I'm your host, Sam Mickey. And this week, I'm really excited to welcome onto the program, Jason Wirth. Jason, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. So uh, for folks who might not be familiar with you and, and your work, uh, you're a professor of philosophy at Seattle University. And yeah, you work and teach in a variety of areas, uh, continental philosophy, Buddhist philosophy, aesthetics, environmental philosophy, and uh, some of your books include Nietzsche and Other Buddhas, Philosophy After Comparative Philosophy, uh, Mountains, Rivers, and the Great Earth, reading Gary Snyder and Dogen in an Age of Ecological Crisis. Uh, you have a monograph on Milan Kundera, Commiserating with Devastated Things, which is a powerful title. Um, Schelling's Practice of the Wild, so more Practice of the Wild. We'll have to talk a lot about that. And you've also edited uh, some volumes uh, with Brett Davis and Brian Schroeder about uh, what one on Japanese philosophy in the Kyoto School and another one engaging Dogen's Zen, uh, both really great anthologies. Uh, you're also a Soto Zen priest and founder and director of the Seattle University Eco Sangha. So lots of things going on there. And I don't know, one of the things I really appreciate about your work that's very inspiring to me is just how capacious it is and you know your ability to engage with uh you know asian religions western thought continental philosophy environmental issues uh film literature indigenous traditions uh there's there's really not a perspective on the planet that you don't seem to be able to enter into dialogue with and to me that's just that's crucial for our time right now that kind of capacious uh, way of thinking and feeling uh, we, we need a lot more of that. So I think to get started, I want to ask a kind of personal question. How did you become so capacious? Well, how did you start getting interested in like the intersections of, of Buddhism, ecology, you know, because you clearly weren't raised as a Buddhist. You know, I know you personally and like me have a Catholic background. And so how did, how did that open up without, you know, you don't have to tell your whole life story, but I'm really curious how you got into the trajectory that you're on. Well, I would first take that question and ask myself a secondary question. Mm -hmm. How did philosophy ever come to be non-capacious? Mm -hmm. Because we assume from where we start, our starting point is it's so seldom capacious and so, and so rarely genuinely capacious, but that's not the history of philosophy. Yeah. That's not even a philosophical mood. Uh, I was always struck by something that Jasper said in the 50s, mm -hmm. you know, we're born philosophers. That is the child mind. That is in Zen what we call beginner's mind or original mind. Um, time to go to church. Well, what's a church? Mm -hmm. uh, Anne Ethel just died. Well, what is death? Mm -hmm. uh, time to go to school. Why do we have to go to school? Um, so we begin with no knowledge, but loss of philosophy. And the tragedy of our culture is we give people knowledge and thereby destroy philosophy. So Really, I, I want to put first the burden on how do we destroy or disable philosophy? Because really, it's happened to all of us, even those who find themselves as adults, not even remotely inclined philosophically. And then the second thing I would say is, well, what are some of the motivations for disabling the capaciousness that is the beginner's mind of philosophical inquiry? Well, one, there's lots of personal reasons, result them all. You know, I look at someone who's struggling more deeply than I am, and I see that I'm not doing my homework, that I'm not living my life, I'm not taking ownership of my life, I'm not taking ownership of the politics or societal norms uh, under which I live and with which other people uh, live along with me. Uh, I see those things. So there's personal neurotic reasons. Um, philosophy's hard. It makes you confused. Um, it's a lot of work for, you know, if you're neurotic, no gain, as in no sure answers, no conclusions. Uh, I think of what Flaubert said about stupidity. It's the demand for conclusions, you know, but what is stupidity? You know, the stupefaction of philosophical questions is original birthright. That is our capaciousness. Um, we are stupefied before it. So there's those yeah. things. But also I wanna look at the politics and economics of it also. 
Um, if we look at this country right here, the poor United States on um, today, July 4th, in which um, only a few of us are really excited to be celebrating the birthday of this country. Uh, it's hard times, certainly not capacious times, certainly not inspiring times. Um, nonetheless, if you look at, say, the birthplace of philosophy in the United States, uh, certainly one of the most famous, uh, the Concord, Massachusetts area, Emerson, Thoreau, Alcott, um, this crowd, uh, you look at the Harvard School with Peirce and James, this Emerson, of course. Wow, yeah. what a capacious beginning. You look at John Dewey being an, you know, a public intellectual, you know, somebody that even people who can't do philosophy had at least heard of. Right. Um, now you hear of a philosopher because they're in a, they've been me too or in some other kind of scandal or uh, we, we discovered some rumor they were a Nazi. Uh, yeah. But you can't be famous for actually having a thought that's worth that's entertaining. Um, well, what's the politics and economics for destroying even this capacious potential? How did we go from the American Philosophical Association being founded um, by William James to a society that not so long ago refused um, participation of the William James Society on grounds that they weren't even philosophical. Wow. How does this happen? Well, I think John McCumber has got two books on this. I think they're worth reading. Hmm. Um, if philosophy is always rigorous, uh, has its place in the academy, is producing all kinds of intellectual capital, but it's micrology. So the discourse of the little the discourse of the trivial, it'll always be true. It'll always be rigorously true, but it'll always be trivially true, which means it'll always be irrelevant. Um, you know, I'm struck by the following. You know, it's really, really hard uh, to say, to be a Socrates in this world, if by that uh, we mean you could say something in which somebody says, wow, that argument's cutting too close to the bone. We're going to have to kill you or otherwise <laughs> silence you. I mean, you can be silenced for, you know, speaking against a, a certain party in this country, but not philosophically. As soon as you speak about it philosophically, like what? Yeah. You have to go right back down to, uh, you know, some little tweet that people can comprehend and they'll just simply say, you're with us or against us. But we can't. So we found a way to be able to ignore philosophy. Um. I think of the first president of Ghana, who had a PhD in philosophy, the first country to be um, decolonized in the big decolonization movement uh, after the Second World War. He said, look, here in Ghana, I'll tell you what's great about Ghana. There's a lot of people who want to kill me for what I think, philosophically. So, you know, the trick is to make philosophy uh, just free speech. You know, that's what you think. Uh, that's your perspective. Uh, both siderism, mm -hmm. you know, Heidegger and some moron who's um, spent their entire life on the lamb from their own thoughts, you know, equal value. Right. And so, yeah, you can say anything. That's, and here's the thing capaciousness is not say anything, but it's not micrology. That's its extreme paradox. How do you speak specifically, carefully? Uh, how do you really, uh, you, know, you know, I mean, I, I think of another definition of stupidity. This is the one from Musel, Musel's incredible uh, Man Without Qualities, a novel that has no logical end, killed him writing it, you know, uh, and he wasn't even halfway done with it and it's thousands of pages long. Um, if you love truth, you have to love your narrow. Your mind is narrowing, it's not because of micrological, it's because the truth of the universe is at least as big as the universe. So I mean, it's it's narrowing, but it's not becoming micrological. Mm. The truth of the human heart is not everything is the case or both siderism. Uh, it's complex, paradoxical, dynamic, interdependent, uh, but it's not just anything. It's not just and the alternative facts of the heart. But stupidity, anything can be true because you're stupefied. And so you have really uh, 
that's where our macrology is now, the macrology of stupidity. Mm -hmm. Anything can be true, everything can be said, but that's nihilism. Everything can be true because nothing is true. Right. When truth is as big as the universe, it's enormous. You know, you disable it by making it trivial or you disable it by making it uh, stupefy, you know, the stupefaction of the false macrological. That's great. That's beautifully said. It reminds me, you know, in uh, Nietzsche and other Buddhas, uh, is a great example of how to talk about these things in a way where it's not just that anything's true. It's not like you're just saying, oh, Nietzsche is straightforwardly a Buddha. It's actually very complicated. And you're staging this kind of co-illuminating encounter between and across all these different uh, philosophers. And so, you know, the subtitle, it's, you know, philosophy after comparative philosophy. And so it's one of those, it's like comparative philosophy was seemed to be narrowing us, keeping us stupid in a certain way. And there's this other possibility emerging. And so, yeah, the, the way that you're able to be very specific about like Nietzsche's texts or members of the Kyoto school, while also opening up to this larger truth of the universe, uh, seems to be really exemplary for that kind of thinking. Yeah, you know, the most important uh, term in the title, Nietzsche and other Buddhas, one of the most important terms in philosophy for the last couple hundred years is the and. And this really, uh, I think, a careful appreciation of our, our small bits of philosophical uh, progress in the last couple of centuries. You think of being in time, being an event, truth and method, uh, the list goes on. Um, but this and is not one nor the other, but the between, the third. That's hard to think. So if you look at Nietzsche, for example, what did Nietzsche think about Buddhism? Well, honestly, most of what he said about Buddhism was demonstrably false. Yeah. Um, I might even want to say um, demonstrably false because he had, in addition, the limits of his day and his own philosophical project. He's not great on the history of philosophy, East or West, frankly, but that wasn't his thing. Uh, he was working at his own project, but his other prejudice was Schopenhauer. Right. Schopenhauer considered himself a Buddhist, uh, that gives you Nietzsche's ambivalent relationship to Buddhism because he really esteems Schopenhauer, the last European event he calls Schopenhauer. But he also thinks that Schopenhauer is the prophet of nihilism. Mm -hmm. I might say nihilism would be also the stupefaction of the false macrology. Yeah, we could just say anything because nothing really matters. Yeah. Uh, Nietzsche's looking pretty good on that <laughs> prophecy right now, in this yeah, country anyway. That's true. In our time of great nihilism. Um, so that would be Nietzsche, you know, that's what he thinks. Um, the Zen side, of course, has their own agenda, although they're much more generous towards Nietzsche. But the real key is not to say, well, Nietzsche says A, uh, the Kyoto School or Hakuin or Dogen says B, well, what's the same and what's different? First of all, who cares what's the same and what's different? Mm -hmm. From where are you asking that question? What, from the surveyor's mind? from the administrator's mind, hmm. from the accountant's mind? Are you just taking notes? Are you just filling out an Excel spreadsheet? Is that what you're doing? You know, this is the same and that is different. Well, so what? What is the same and what is different? Hmm. Now, Nietzsche is very interesting from a Zen perspective, not based on his capacity to understand anything about Zen. But his critique of Schopenhauer, which is his critique of Buddhism more broadly, at least Mahayana, uh, that critique also would be uh, a very, very deep Zen critique of that, of those issues within the Zen tradition. Right. Yeah, and, and then the things that, uh, you know, really kind of spark between them, uh, like food, right? Uh, whereas Zen, you know, for Dogen, right, the tens of the cook is so crucial. And then that's one of those things where Nietzsche is like, oh, yeah, diet is everything. And the more that you can, you know, really eat well, then you can really find like the truth of existence through eating. Yeah. Nietzsche really thought, so first of all, what's interesting about this is when Dogen in the Tenzo Kyokun is writing this, I think one among his most famous writings, it's even in the Zen context, counterintuitive. I mean, the big thing about Zen, and this is, of course, Dogen's own argument, Tenzo Kyokun, when he looks at his own life, you know, Zen is about the big koans and this 
fancy pants practice. And he meets this Chinese chef who's like, no, 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 I'm not going to do koan study with you. I got to go back and cook. Ah, what about, you don't know anything about Zen. Come <laughs> see me later. Um, you know, and of course, the Tenso Kyokun is we take food for granted as if it's just fuels for the things that really matter. Um, but it's not, you know, first and foremost in the Buddhist tradition, something of deep practice merit. But the preparation and consumption of food is as deep a form of practice as any other practice for Dogen and for many others. On Nietzsche's side, of course, it's it's even more woeful. Mm -hmm. um, the eating would be a philosophical topic. Um, at best, seems like the mendacious form of macrology. You know, you're just making anything philosophy because nothing in particular is philosophy, which is insane. Uh, it points out that we have an extremely abstract, uh, not practice-oriented uh, relationship to thinking. And of course, as you know, one of Nietzsche's master metaphors is, you know, Western thinking is at a point in its history, uh, it's become dyspeptic. Mm -hmm. It can't digest. It's got a foul stomach. You know, it's constipated. You know, it produces shit, but not even that very well. It's mostly dying within its own body. It can't ruminate. Yeah. And that would be also the truth of reading Nietzsche. You know, we say, well, Nietzsche's position is A, and then maybe we compare it to somebody else or compare late A to early A, as if the accountant making some checkpoints, these are the same, these are different. Well, so what? That's what we're going to do with it? Say it's the same, that's different? Mm -hmm. um, for Nietzsche is rumination and of course the, the metaphor for rumination is the ruminants including like most famously the cow uh, if the grass is any good book I'd like to hope I aspire for that list to include I don't know maybe the best pages of Nietzsche and other Buddhas uh, but the point isn't to tell you how to think or tell you what's what or tell you what A is it's a rumination on many things, including a rumination on rumination. Mm -hmm. And rumination, you know, the grass, the text, the thought, the matters, the great matters, that's the grass. If the cow eats the grass, it's with the hope that it will be nourishment. But unless it can process it and make it its own, what would be medicine, what would be nutrition becomes poison. And Nietzsche would say, look, you know, I'll tell you, Interesting philosophers are going to make the sick sicker. Healthy thought makes the sick sicker because they don't know how to ruminate. And I would say we live in a time in which the micrology, so always true but never relevant, and stupefied macrology, uh, nothing is true and therefore everything is philosophical because nothing is philosophical. So going between the trivial and the nihilistic, that is an absolute crisis of rumination. Rumination is producing the macrology of our universe. Yeah, and the kind of terrible irony that our uh, inability to ruminate is causing an ecological crisis, which is making it such that ruminants don't have a, a safe habitat anymore. Uh, that's um, a really big you know, part of all your work is there's an underlying sense that we, we're writing in a time of mass extinction, right? That, that whatever Nietzsche announced as the death of God is very much also the death of nature. And so, you know, you feel the sense of urgency that, you know, we need to, we can't just kind of wait this out and hope it gets better at some point. Like we really need to do something now. It's deeply urgent. So the ecological crisis really informs a lot of your work. Uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you came to that. Cause again, that's one of those things, not all people working with philosophy Get into environmental philosophy so where did was there an event in your life or was there some texts you were reading what made you think like i need to take this up at a, at a philosophical level yeah i mean to me i think it's not optional i think the this small little provisional schema that i've outlined uh today uh this place this third moment between uh irrelevant micrology and a stupefied macrology um, is really to live in the universe, to live in an ecology, to realize that thinking is part of a greater whole. And 
this is, I'll give you a, a really Zen moment in Nietzsche that makes you say, well, you know, he's always going to be valuable for the Zen conversation. Mm-hmm. In the phrase, I think, only one of those two terms can be true. Mm-hmm. There's thinking or there's myself. But if there's thinking and it's not my thinking, first of all, it's, you didn't make up the language. You didn't write all the books that inspire you. Uh, yeah, you may, this moment may contribute some new insight to it or not. Uh, it may make it relevant to our time in a way in which it was not clearly before this moment, but it's not a new thought. Uh, the fetish for the new, that's more capitalism, the latest and the greatest, you know, the spring fashions of thought. Uh, that's not thinking. Thinking is always the great matters. Um, and so uh, I would say then, uh, if it's not just something that I'm doing, it's, I'm part of a whole. I'm part of an ecology. And not only that, I would say when someone like Zarathustra says, I, I come to teach you to be, quote, true to the earth, uh, he's pointing to the Anthropocene of Aunt Lolette uh, as a kind of spiritual crisis. And I like using Nietzsche in this way because by spiritual crisis, I'm not necessarily saying this should be an apology for theism. You can take it that way if that's your inclination, but you don't have to take it that way if that's not your inclination. Uh, But it's a spiritual crisis in the sense that there's something about how we think, including how we think about thinking, how we ruminate on rumination. We don't ruminate well on it. Even the thought of rumination makes us dyspeptic. But we're in a time of ecological dyspepsia. You know, we're unable to to be good tenzos, to be good monastic chefs, to be part of the ecology. I, mean, I think we see this even in terms of the crisis in environmental philosophy in which the paradigms are either things like, oh, it's a moral problem. What should we do? So we still get to give ourselves a free pass as an ethical agent. Don't see the complicity of the subject that should or should not with the problem they're trying to solve. Uh, that's a huge problem. Um, or, you know, we somehow uh, imagine that it's, a call for new policies, uh, but you know our policies are strange. I mean, you take for example the 1964 Wilderness Act hmm. that creates wilderness as untouched by human except for footprints. Well, that's a political act. I'm for that act because we live in a time of emergency. But I recognize that the philosophical underpinnings of that are unsustainable and unwise. A, it's politics, and B, it it. Uh, Uh, skips the key question. The key question is, how do we live within our ecologies, including philosophically? Philosophy is part of an ecology. And so I would say this, uh, the irrelevant microology is it's, yeah, it's a trivial, uh, non-productive at best part of an ecology, as in it's just some little moment that's not in any way enhancing the ecology at its best, but that's probably pretty rare. Most of the time, it's just a symptom of the disease of the ecology. You surrender our aspirations for wisdom and for a deep sense of belonging, uh, something that I think, uh, you know, uh, we should learn again from all of our indigenous ancestors all over the world. Now, these long-lived cultural lineages Their cultures were philosophical, at least in the sense that they uh, lived long time. The cultures persisted because they found out how they belonged. Mm -hmm. And we philosophize with no sense of what this has to do, even with the university, let alone our students' lives. We just take it for granted that they're interested in the mind-body problem. Um, Aren't you? (laughs) Aren't we all? You know, don't we all want to build robots that serve us constantly? I mean, isn't that self-evident? Um, you know, but we've lost any sense of how how this belongs to the university, how the university belongs to the social economic aspirations of a culture, and how that culture belongs to the, its sustaining conditions. Mm-hmm. So I'm very struck, for example, on this. Um, by something that the Aboriginal philosopher Tyson Yunkaporta said. He called this the emu principle. He said, the emu, that little flightless bird that runs around like an ostrich, second only to the ostrich in terms of really big birds that can't get in the air. 
The emu is really, really fast, apparently. And because it's so fast, no one can catch it. That's one of its um, little strategies to have more emus in the future. And the emu thinks, wow, I'm just faster than you. I'm better than you. He calls this the emu principle. You know? And the number one job he has of culture, its first responsibility is to crush the emu principle. You know, start meditating on the fact that we're no more important than a rock. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, somehow a demotion. It's we've built ourselves up because we have demoted everything besides ourselves. You know, the rocks too. Yeah, rocks too matter. And so to start from that, I mean, which of course and then means the stories we tell and the, the wisdom we seek is contextualized within our sustaining conditions and is so non-dyspeptically. Yeah, and I <clears throat> I know that- I think it's not optional, so I'm saying. I think it's not optional. I mean, it's not a, an yeah. elective question. Yeah, and when people treat it as optional, they're falling into that emu principle. Like, yeah, oh, I'm better it. than that. I don't need to deal with this. I'm gonna focus on these other things. And uh, I'm smart enough to decide the specific things I wanna focus on. And you get into that trivial kind of uh, mentality again. And, uh, so, you know, I know a lot of this uh, for you also uh, falls into this beautiful phrase, the practice of the wild. And so you've written about, you know, how shelling seems to have a practice of the wild. I'm very curious about that, because uh, obviously the term is really associated with Gary Snyder, uh, a yeah. great poet, essayist, thinker, activist. Uh, so you got to got to get into the practice of the wild. I maybe start by saying a little bit about your work with Snyder, because um, I had this great opportunity to uh, see you and Gary uh, do a, a reading uh, and get you both to sign your book. And it's just such a great event. And uh, so h- how does how's Gary Snyder's thinking informing your work? And then we'll have to pick up, how does Schelling have this? Because that's just one of those things where I'm like, you're telling me some old German philosopher was on top of the practice of the wild? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know, Snyder is uh, a very, very deep Zen practice. Uh, 10 years of Rinzai training, but also the Ring of Bone, which is uh, a beautiful Zendo. Uh, it was Aitken Roshi's first uh, assignment in the United States. Um, but it's, that's, you know, built within a, just a few feet of his, where he lives on the San Juan Ridge um, in Nevada County in California. Um, so he's got a deep lifelong Zen practice. And I think it's been very fruitful for him. Uh, I think it informs a lot of his work. Um, I think he also has Buddhist right speech, consummate speech, careful speech, treasuring what language can and cannot do, uh, letting language not be uh, either um, vapidly micrological or stupefied, stupefied macrology, but using it expressively and powerfully to evoke and bring forth for our consideration the great matters. Uh, so in that way, he sees some deep healing, expressive capacity in language that's been in his poetry. And in part, uh, I think the challenge of the Dharma, and again, by Dharma, I don't mean, um, you know, that you have to be a Buddhist or not a Buddhist or anything like that at all. Just how do we find a way to translate the wisdom of our elders so that it speaks to the great matters now and here? And that requires both deep reverence for the accomplishments of our elders and but deep creativity i mean in a way we have to i less love this phrase we have to uh, remember the future i uh, take that from a couple of indigenous philosophers ramosa uses that also some others use it um, uh, remember the future uh, but he's really quite good at remembering the future and practice of the wild is a term that uh, is Gary Snyder remembering the future? So practice, um, it can be indigenous life ways, which are highly cultivated through story and through ritual and through uh, all kinds of other forms of self-formation. Uh, his own training in, uh, in the Zen lineage, uh, which is highly creative, but highly formative, highly ritualized, uh, not just sitting, but uh, meals, language, etiquette to use his terms um practice of what what is this word the wild Uh, i think a really key uh helpful way is to get really good at these third terms Hmm. 
uh, that are holding together things that you can compare and contrast, uh, but you're not, where are you when you're doing that? You're either one or the other, or you're a bookkeeper. Right. Now, where is it to be deeply uh, in this and? And the wild is one of those great third terms, because on the one hand, you have what we imagine not to be the wild in our contemporary new world disorder, which is civilization. Uh, civilization, I would say, highly evolved, highly internally self-regulating, self-referential modes of living. So we look to our culture and to our technology and to our uh, inherited life ways as enough. You know, the, the climate change is an engineering problem, um, as we've heard from former secretaries of state. Like, for example, that was Rex Tillerson's um, right. uh, estimation of what we needed to do. Uh, but that, so a civilization would be that. It's internally self-regulated. Now we know this about all civilizations. None have been long lived. Okay. Every time you enter into a closed system, entropy begins. Entropy is not what happens to all things. It happens to all things as soon as they close themselves. You close themselves, you know, it begins. They will eventually become undone. That's the way of all things. That's been the way of all civilizations. They've come undone. Uh, we look at the largest and most complicated civilization in the history of civilizations, the global order right now, wholly closed within a certain geopolitical economic ideology. Uh, not only that, but the most unsustainable, by that I mean because it's globally distributed unsustainability, so it's the most unsustainable in that way, because it's <laughs> going to spare almost no one. So this incredibly complex civilization that is burning down the natural capital of the earth at an unprecedented pace will be the only one that survives and bucks the trend. That's insane, but that's civilization on the one hand. That we imagine there's civilization and it's the opposite of the wild. So you go hiking, you leave your civilized mind, you go into your wild mind, or I don't know, when my students go on spring break, they want to go wild as in anything goes, right. but this is crazy because the earth's not showing as anything goes. That's stupidity. That's stupefaction before the earth. You know, that's the nihilism of anything can be true. Uh, the earth's just going wild. No, <laughs> it's the exact opposite. That we're not paying attention. And therefore, entropy is continuing as it always has. So you have on the one hand civilization, on the other hand, what we imagine to be the wild, but the wild, that's the third term, does not exclude civilization. Um, if you think of long-lived cultures, the cultures that were long-lived found a way to live in the wild. You know, they found out how they belonged, if you will. Um, so it does not exclude civilization, and nor does it imagine the wild is uh, anything goes. It's the natural, interdependent, complex, open uh, processes. So the wild, in a way, could be one way of translating the really key Taoist term. It's also big for early Buddhism, Zeron, so of itself. We might now call that autopoiesis. Mm -hmm. So the whole creating itself, uh, the, the autogenesis of, of, of things, on their own, the spontaneity of things. Uh, Zeron became Shizen in Japanese. Shizen now is the word for natural science and part of the Anthropocene, oh. but it's an old Taoist term, the old Taoist, uh, Buddhist, even in Japan way of reading Zeron, hmm. so of itself. So the wild is things, yeah, civilization. It should be more wild and the wild, you know, yeah, it's an open system, but it's not a stupid system. The other way to understand the wild is that's a way to say dharma. Mm -hmm. So very straightforwardly, practice of the wild is dharma practice. But the dharma is not beliefs that you, for whatever reason, elect to hold, uh, or you just, just seize on to because you're a Buddhist. 
there's no isms. There's no Buddhist. There's no Buddhism. I mean, that's not a Buddhist teaching, ironically. Um, you know, the Dharma, the way of things of themselves, the way of things from the perspective of the things themselves, the way of things from the perspective of suchness, not the way of things in terms of our needs, our wants, our engineering plans. So the way of things, not from the perspective of a spatially alienated civilization. So one that has, and again, I would say this, as much as I love Marx, I would say the great limitation of that uh, economic paradigm is that it puts all of its eggs in the basket of temporal alienation. Mm. You know, that our time spent uh, working for the bourgeoisie robs us of a creative use of ourselves, of our species, a creative relationship to nature. Um, but there's no sense that uh, we're alienated from the earth itself, from its processes, from the wild. And civilization is spatially alienated. Mm. And a practice of the wild is to re-inhabit the earth, to use Peter Berg's famous phrase. And you asked about shelling. Well, What's so remarkable about Schelling, one of the things I like about Schelling, you know, uh, this great post-Kantian philosopher, but also at the time of science, Kant himself understood himself to be um, you know, saving science from a Haman and Hume and skepticism. You know, he, of course, his great genius is he saw the limits of the scientific paradigm, the limits of a scientific claim, but he still wanted to save it. And of course, that's a good idea, but so does Schelling. I think Kant underestimated the problem of how to save science. Mm. The problem of how to save science in the 19th century was how to save it also from another danger, not skepticism, but the flip side, dogmatism, yeah. or what we would say right now, positivism, mm -hmm. a great flatlining of all things, yeah. a loss of their genesis, of their depth, um, you know, making everything, how shall we say, you know, manifest, presentist. Um, now, I would say uh, philosophy has not been a huge help in saving science from its worst side, but science has been a great help to itself. <laughs> so I don't think this is a great description of the cutting edge of contemporary science and really for the last century or so. Yeah. Um, but certainly scientism also persists as one of our ideologies and mythologies. But, you know, putting aside the power of science, you know, our general sense that the earth is just there for us. But the question isn't how do we belong to a complex interdependent system? And do we think it systemically, but freely? Uh, not that I'm free in it, but the system itself is open. Right. That's all freedom means. At its ground, it's not closed. And so a holistic system, if you will, how are we of a holistic system? And if we don't get this, if we don't think what Schelling called the living ground of nature, things are going to end extremely badly. Now, he's saying that already by 1797. They're going to end very badly. And wow, it's, it's hard to say that he was wrong on that. I mean, this is one of the great calls, uh, earliest calls. I mean, there's been other prophetic moments. We've made certain scientific discoveries that had we had the courage to think them through, like, you know, um, you know, we, you know, we made we we figured out certain things that would have been true about the dynamics of climate change already by the you know, end of the 19th century. Right. Um, but oh, it can't happen that fast. So yeah, you know. but you know, no shelling. I mean, this was a deep, again, returning to this word that I used earlier with some discomfort, a deep spiritual illness. Mm -hmm. And Nietzsche sees that also a deep spiritual illness in our relationship to the earth and to ourselves. In the same way, I would say it's a, I mean, Schelling's term was a, a Geistes Krankheit. Hmm. I mean, that's it. Literally, I mean, that means a mental illness, but really, I would say we, I would want to just take it more literally a disease of the spirit. Yeah. And I would say, yeah, philosophy is always dealing with the disease of the spirit. Um, you know, I asked questions when I was young because I did not have the answers. Uh, I lose the deep 
insight into myself and the world by which I ask questions, but I cling on to the answers that I was given and what made it possible to have knowledge, to wonder about things, gives me the sickness of just holding on to knowledge uh, while having lost philosophy. Mm -hmm. And that's already the Anthropocene. We can see, on the one hand, I wanna say it's the innocence of asking questions and the sickness of getting answers while losing our beginner's mind. Right. Yeah, and you know, um, talking about, you know, spiritual, that's a tough word to use. Like you use it with some discomfort. Uh, it depends exactly what you mean. Uh, reminds me of this uh, great piece you had in The Trumpeter last year, Deep Social Ecology. And uh, which was just, it's one of those things in environmental philosophy, there's been this terrible conflict between deep ecology, on the one hand saying, this is a spiritual problem. And then you have social ecology saying, no, 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 it's a, it's a socioeconomic problem. It's about politics. And then you're reading that and you're saying, no, actually these, that's one problem. And so, uh, which, you know, there's a very helpful way to understand spirituality, spiritual, the deep doesn't mean separate from the shallow side of, you know, economics or policy politics. Um, so I wonder if you could say a little bit more about deep social ecology. Uh, I think that's, you know, that really resonates with a lot of stuff you've been saying, uh, you know, while we're talking, the spiritual isn't, isn't disconnected from the material, uh, the human socioeconomic, those are all kind of integrated for you. Yeah. Uh, I'll go into it first, the back door. I think this is, uh, at least for me, it's a very compelling problematic. Uh, How have we generally thought about nature in terms of our political traditions? I would say a really telling move is our reliance upon the social contract Hmm. and the state of nature. And how does the state of nature emerge? Now, it purports to be we were in nature and we figured, well, this really sucks, so we should do this. Or this is really great. I hope we don't do that, if you're Rousseau. Right. But some version of where but no one is asking this question from being in nature or knowing anything about nature. You're asking about it by either holding up retroactively the status quo. You're, you know, you're trying to uh, argue that what we have already is great. Uh, and we should continue. So you are retroactively constituting the interests that are already prevailing, or maybe you're critiquing them, but you're already speaking from the hold of a certain social political standpoint and thinking about it retroactively. So Rousseau gives us a nature that never was, we're all (laughs) awesomely getting along. No, it's hard. Now Hobbes gives us something that really was just, you know, him imagining that as horrible as civilization was, it must've been even worse. (laughs) But you know, but none of this is what deep ecology sees, for example. Deep ecology is, let's start with the science of ecology. Let's pay attention to the sustaining conditions and ask ourselves, now this gets written off as a spiritual question, but let's just, by spiritual, we don't mean, let's then have a fantastical moment where we import some magical dimension. Let's ask ourselves, wisdom. So the job of a scientific ecology is not to be wise about what they discover. It's just to lay out uh, some of the rudiments of how a given bioregion operates and its level of complexity in genesis. Deep ecology. So the deep is just acting on the science of ecology is then asking questions like, well, what kind of economics what kind of politics are appropriate to these sustaining conditions? Uh, put in other words, deep ecology then says, given how a bioregion works, how would humans belong? How would anything belong mm-hmm. to it? Now that's all spiritual is doing. And quite noticeably, if you take sustenance or nutrition from say theism, fine, but you're not, pulling that stuff in uh to cheat right Uh, right. get your get your spiritual nourishment and courage from that if that's your thing uh but be prepared to talk to the atheists because all wisdom is is going to be able to deal wisely with how an ecology works i'll give you a second example of deep ecology and this was so not the arnie ness version arnie ness had 
two formulations of it. And I would say, don't live by the letter of that. Right. Deep ecology is just to ask deep questions about the science of ecology. So it's the wisdom of ecological living, which assumes not the politics of what you imagine the ecology to be or the economics of what you imagine it to be. It means actually learning what it is. The second example I would use of a deep ecologist, but never use this term. Um, he was a very ecological thinker, but I wouldn't say he was an ecological activist because the agenda was different because he was standing rock Sioux and that's Vine Deloria Jr. But he says this about science. He says, look, you know, uh, he tells the story of uh, early settlers coming in to the indigenous elders and they say, well, you know, um, let's, let me show you how science works. And they show them how science works. And, you know, aren't you amazed? Don't you want to be one of us? And the elder goes, okay, well, you know, it's amazing what you do. I can see that you know many more things than we will ever know that are true. Uh, you can do many things, some of which we don't even understand. And so I can see your science is true and that it's powerful, but it is insufficient. Now that's the thing. It's this insufficiency that deep ecology is interested in. Mm -hmm. And so Vine Deloria says, well, really what's the problem with science isn't that it's false or that it's evil, is that it's immature. That's the term he uses, because you unleash this tremendous power, but in so doing, you so thoroughly demote the capaciousness of philosophical thinking that it's impossible to say anything wise, because either philosophy is trivially micrological, and therefore it says true things that are never wise things, that never matter, they don't speak to the great matters, like, what are we doing to ourselves? Um, or... They stupefy the whole thing. The wisdom becomes new age and new age is stupid, frankly. It's bad science, you know, it's magical thinking, it's woo woo okay. and it's anything can be true. Uh, wisdom is just a mature relationship to that, a deeper relationship to that. Yeah. Uh, the immaturity of science is that science is true but it's superficial. It's insufficient for living life. So, for example, when lots of scientists study the world and they can see that climate change and many other ecological crises are, are, are imminent, are unfolding, are uh, going to end very, very poorly, uh, you know, they're on the front lines, many of them fighting it. But they still themselves, I sense, uh, still seek for deeper ways of being, how do, we, how do we speak to the science in a way that is wise and compelling? non-trivially yet non-stupidly yeah. now that's hard or what well, would you say vine alert mature mm -hmm. you know the settler colonialists were immature that science is the most dangerous thing not because science is bad science is not bad for a mature mind science can be part of how we uh, help all sentient beings flourish right. but you know problem is we have no idea what we're doing with it so that's deep ecology, is that insight. Now, this, the power of social ecology, of course, is I think what makes it so incredibly important right now is that it keeps ecology from being a niche item. Mm -hmm. Now, social ecology really understands the ecological or systemic uh, origins of oppression, of domination. That what we do to the natural world, well, I mean, Bookchin said we learn that not from we didn't learn to enslave people by enslaving animals no we learned to enslave animals from enslaving people now right. i don't care which of those came first chicken or the egg it's just all you have to simply say is yeah what we do to each other social politically including in capitalism uh, and what we do to the earth are of a piece and so Ecology can't separate itself from things like the recent decision of the Supreme Court uh, overturning Roe v. Wade. It can't separate itself from women's issues. It can't separate itself from Black Lives Matter. It can't separate itself from issues like reparations. It can't separate itself from enduring restoration of justice for indigenous peoples, including land justice. Yeah. It can't. Those are not ecologically an option. 
So deep social ecology means our, our economics and politics have to be wise and ecologically broad without uh, stupid macrology or vapid micrology. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a, a, a good way to also put uh, what you know Pope Francis calls integral ecology it really resonates yes. with that uh, that as well. And you know, I don't know, I'm trying to be mindful of time. I try not to make these too long. I know there's some like three hour podcasts out there. We try and keep it short. So I won't keep you much Lots. longer. But one thing I got to hear about, and we'll just have to have you come back after this book is out, but right now it's kind of in process, Turtle Island Anarchy, yes. uh, which just sounds like a fun time. But also you can tell, you know, some of the references you're made, like Vine Deloria Jr. You're drawing on indigenous wisdom. And of course, for, uh, you know, the indigenous inhabitants of North America, this continent is Turtle Island. Yes. So as we're seeing the just collapse of American democracy, it seems like anarchy is a, a possibility that might help us I don't know, remember the future, right? Uh, so what, what are you doing in Turtle Island anarchy? Yeah, so you uh, are quite right about the Turtle Island part of it. And I just hold on to this, you know, Turtle Island is North America. Uh, you don't see no, you don't see different things. You see differently. Hmm. So it's the same thing, see differently. I mean, that's also a, a, something that Zen has in common with indigenous self-cultivation. You know, it's not what you see, it's how you see what you see. Dogen and many others call it the opening of the true Dharma eye. Uh, some indigenous activists uh, call it in cultivating indigenous mind. Uh, so Turtle Island is just to look at our bioregions differently, more anarchically. Now, what is anarchy? It's a word I'm also, it's like spirituality. It's what I'm loath to use because you just walk right into a debate so undisciplined so macrologically vapid that you could spend your entire life trying to just get a sane sense of how the word works. Uh, but anarchy, I mean, I, one way to put it would be deep social ecology would be a model of anarchy. Um, so the first thing we have to say right off the bat is anarchy is not the wild scene in the stupid sense of going wild. It's not lawlessness, uh, rather it's a sense of organization so, you know, autopoiesis, for example, is not things are going wild. Open does not mean anything can happen. Open is, it is the carefully demarcatable, but nonetheless, always critically surprising way of things. Uh, their openness, you know, thinking of things, not just from what there is to think about, but from the openness of what there is to think about. Um, so anarchy would not be uh, for sure also. So if it's not wild as in anything goes, that's just being drunk. Um, it's also not libertarianism. So the old 19th century thinkers used the term libertarian, but that has been stolen. Libertarian means, anarchy means, no one can tell me what to do, don't tread on me. Right. Living out here in the West, as we both do, that's a lot of libertarians. Yeah, okay, maybe you can call that a form of anarchy, but it's the exact opposite of the original theory. The issue isn't we can do whatever we want because that's what corporations want. They love libertarianism because, well, Supreme Court just made us a little more libertarian. But, you know, Shell being libertarian, Exxon being libertarian, you know, fracking being more libertarian. Yeah. This is not good. This is also not coherent. We're all going to be free as a few of us are free to destroy the rest of us. Yeah. It's a very problematic position. So anarchic is, how shall we say, uh, non-dominating, non-centralized, mutual aid or cooperative. I mean, ecology is a, it's a great cooperation. Each thing is itself by virtue of what it is not insofar as it works cooperatively, is cooperatively, is co-creatively with all the other forms of its being with which it shares its own genesis. That's anarchy. And I would say really, I, I think, um, I'm always very struck by Kropotkin, uh, at least in the sense of how he 
just roots himself also in the natural world. Just what it is to look at how insects live or, right. you know, or even it's these so-called lone animals who can come together and work cooperatively when they need to, when it's important to be together. Uh, so anarchy both has a sense of freedom derived from an underlying uh, mutual aid. And I want to say that's also the wisdom and compassion of the Zen perspective. Uh, so I think it's a Zen way of putting it. I think this is also the cooperation that has been key to indigenous cultures all over the world. So I trace those. Their stories are really quite extraordinary in that way. But also putting all that aside, um, we're not on a path that's going to end well. I mean, the amazing gift of that is that's getting harder and harder to deny. Right. The level of stupidity to deny that is just becoming more and more. And believe you me, uh, as we congratulate ourselves for being the, the, you know, the greatest species in the history of the earth, you know, some of us will, <laughs> will hold on to our stupidity till the end. Um, but it's not going to end well. And the price of stupidity is just, it's just going up. I mean, it's ascendant. It's uh, invest in it because it's going to give you huge, huge returns. <laughs> it's going to become more and more expensive. Right. Uh, so I'll say this, you know, it's a book of, about non-stupid ways of living with all sentient beings. With restorative justice, uh, both for the earth and for her peoples, human and non-human, reparations, mindfulness, attentiveness, um, eco-economics and eco-politics that emerge sustainably from where we are, a general assembly of all beings, that is, the beings of uh, a given bioregion. I mean, shifting the paradigm by which we think of ourselves um, more like, okay, rather than what do I think about the planet, how do I think more like a planet? Mm. That's great. And this is also the problem too, of ethics, you know, ethics, you know, I love ethics. It's a nice thing. We should try it sometime as a country. <laughs> um, but, you know, ethics still is absolutely mired in the eye. Mm -hmm. really, what should I do? How should I live? Yeah. I would say really gotta go more deeply. How do we, that we equal uh, all humans and all non-human animals with whom we live, how do we belong? Mm -hmm. That's an open question, ask it in an open and genetic way. Nice. That's a good, I think that's a good question to end on. And a good example of, of what, you know, we kind of started this conversation with was me just saying how inspiring it is to be around uh, such a, a capacious thinker. And so, you know, if, if stupidity is this desire to find the conclusion, I'm glad that our conclusion was an open question. Uh, yes. So it couldn't have been better. Always just such a, a pleasure talking to you and, and just really, really grateful to know you. Uh, so thanks for being on here so much, Jason. So much. And uh, so we'll definitely have you, uh, have you back once, the, once Turtle Island Anarchy is out and we'll chat more about it. Uh, I look forward but, to it. Yeah, thanks so much. And, Thank uh, you so much. And thanks to people for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back next week with more conversations for you. So in the meantime, take care and be well. Thank you all very much. Thanks. <laughs>